You know, I'm really thankful for the opportunity to be with all of you here today. When I learned about the history of the beer bombs, and I, I just couldn't read more about it. I mean, it was really incredible to hear about these individuals who were never afraid to do the right thing. Even at times that were so challenging, much more difficult politically than they are now. And I also look at the history of not only the beer bombs, but also of group health and thinking too about how ahead of the times you all are. You know, there's so much that we talk about now with patient-centered care, patient engagement, patient activation, shared decision-making. This is what group health, the principles that group health were founded on. And I find that to be quite incredible that so often now we look at issues. So I was recently at a conference where starting the conference, the, um, the individual asked everyone in the room to raise their hands. And it was a conference specifically on patient engagement. And so the organizer asked everybody to raise their hands if they are hospital administrators. A lot of people raised their hands. Somebody asked, and then he asked, how many of you here are clinicians? Are you doctors, nurses, social workers, et cetera? Probably the rest of the room raised their hands, and there was some overlap between those two. And then he said, how many of you are here, not as your role, not wearing your hat, of being the doctor or the nurse or the administrator, how many of you are here as patients and family members? Recognizing that we're all patients and family members, but how many of you are here in that role? In this room that was probably about this size, nobody raised their hands. And I encounter that all the time in my work as well, that whether it's with patient engagement or community engagement, so often it's seen as one other checkbox as now we've, cons now we've consulted the patient. Now we've consulted the community, whatever it is that that means. And then we're done. And I want to just acknowledge and applaud Group Health for the amazing work that you all have done over the years based on the principles that you're founded on. And I just want to thank you and acknowledge all the individuals in the room who are leaders in group health, who are working in group health, who are clinicians, and all the rest of our community for coming out today. Thank you so much for all your hard work. So I wanted to start today with a story of one of my patients. And I know that, so can I see a show of hands? How, how many of you in the room are clinicians? So quite a lot of you, all right. So I, I'm sure you all will agree that my patients and my patient stories are why I do the work that I do. And so that's why I'm, I wanted to start today with a story of a patient of mine named Jessica. Now Jessica was someone who I got to know very well in the emergency department, which is not necessarily a good thing. It's not our hope, right, that we become the primary, care, uh, the, 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 the primary care doctors for our patients. But I got to know her very well, and I also got to understand where Jessica came from. So by the time that I got to know her, I was a resident, and she was about my age, so she was in her late 20s at the time, and she was someone who, if you looked at her, you wouldn't have known that just six years ago, she was finishing college, she was a competitive swimmer, and she'd also had scholarships, she was working, she was engaged, everything was fine. But then she had a lot of problems with her back. Started taking Percocet, started taking Vicodin, quickly became addicted to these medications and began going to her doctor to look for more. And then her doctor realized what was happening, tried to get her treatment, couldn't get her treatment. She eventually switched to a cheaper version of these opioids, which is heroin. And then her life got into this downward trajectory. She dropped out of school, she lost her job, she lost her house, her family couldn't handle her anymore, and so she became homeless. I mean, she, was, she came to me in the ED all the time at this stage in her life, when she was in this downward spiral. And she wanted one thing, she wanted help. She came to me all the time in the ED requesting that help. Sometimes she had taken too much, she had too much alcohol. Sometimes she had opioids. Sometimes she just wanted help for her addiction. 
And it was one of the most disturbing experiences that I faced. But I think so many clinicians face every day to have to look at her in the eye and say, I know you need help. You know you need help. Your family, your friends, I mean, I, they all know that you need help, but I can't get you that help. Because unlike other illnesses, we just don't treat addiction and mental health as the diseases that they are. Now we just gave an award to our behavioral health integration team, so I think um, this is something that all of you really believe in as well, but I find it to be totally unconscionable that I have to tell my patients in, in the ED that they have to wait days, weeks, maybe even months to get the care that they need. And we would never say to somebody who comes in with chest pain, I'm sorry that you're having a heart attack today. <laughs> and if you're still alive in three weeks, maybe I can get you help then. We would never say that to someone else, and yet we know that nationwide, only about 11% of patients with addiction are able to get the help that they need, which we would never find acceptable for any other illness. And so I remember seeing, you know, thinking to myself, I know what Jessica needs, I know what my patients need in so many other ways, whether it's with housing, whether it's with food. You know, one of the other experiences that all of us clinicians face is knowing that we, our patients, are asking for something other than what we can provide for them at that time. My eight-year-old patient with asthma may be there all the time because of shortness of breath, and I can give an inhaler, I can give steroids, I can listen to his lungs. But what if the issue is that he's homeless, and maybe he and his mom are living near an incinerator, and maybe that's the reason for his asthma. Or maybe we can even do something about his home. But what about the fact that he lives in between two vacant buildings, and there are other allergens in that building? You know, it was a humbling and very disturbing realization as a clinician, that there's so much that we should be doing, but that we can't because of all these other factors that, me that, that make a difference in health. And so Jessica's story doesn't end there. I wouldn't just tell you the story about her if all she was doing was looking for help because I would be telling the same story for hundreds of my patients and your patients. But the reason I remember her so well now is I remember there was one day that she came in again requesting treatment. She had actually just overdosed on heroin. We gave her naloxone. We knew what to do. We saved her. And then said to her, sorry, but the next time that I can get you an appointment is in three weeks. So she went home, wherever home is. And several hours later, on my same shift, the paramedics brought her in, and she had overdosed. And this time, we couldn't resuscitate her. And she died. And I think about her all the time now because I look back and I don't even know how many times she came into the ED. I myself had seen her dozens of times. I had so many opportunities to intervene, but I couldn't save her, and she died. And so it's a reminder to us that the work that we do is really a matter of life and death, that we have to be able to find all those interactions as a point of intervention. And really, all of us as clinicians, we want to do the right thing, but we need the tools to do so. And I also look at, I also think about Jessica now, because I realize that there is this great paradox that's occurring in our healthcare system. And Dr. Larson mentioned this a bit in his, um, in his intro re re remarks as well, that we may think about health as healthcare, because that's the world that we inhabit. And as a clinician, that's the world that I inhabit. I want to make sure that my patient in front of me gets the best care possible. I want to make sure that our, everybody has access to health care as a right, not just as a privilege. Right? We want to make sure that health care is affordable, uh, have good quality health care. That's all important. But here is a paradox that exists. In Baltimore, and many of my examples today will come from Baltimore because that's where I am, but. I suspect it's not dissimilar in Seattle or anywhere else across our country and the world. In Baltimore, we have some of the best medical institutions anywhere in the country. Everybody knows Johns Hopkins. We also have the University of Maryland. We have GBMC. We have Mercy. We have LifeBridge. I mean, we have a, a number of excellent hospitals, healthcare systems, insurers. We have great care. Our city 
the city itself is only 620,000 people. We have 13 hospitals, four sets of FQHCs, and I myself run two clinics. I mean, we have a lot of health care that's available. And yet we look at neighborhoods just two miles apart, where one neighborhood has a life expectancy average of 85 years, and another neighborhood has a life expectancy of 65 years. And you cannot say that what accounts for that difference is health care. Right? I mean, everybody has that access to the health care, not equal access, but the health care is there. But what is it that all actually contributes to health at the end of the day? And Dr. Larson mentioned the emphasis that group health has on where we live, where we work, where we play, right? All these other things that matter. But I want to tell you just about a few others. And actually, I know there are a lot of researchers in the room for this. We don't need research to tell us that no matter how we slice disparities, that it's individuals with, of color, individuals living in poverty, it's individuals who are marginalized in some way who experience the worst health. And that health is not just about health care. Some studies have even said that it's up to 90% of what determines how long we live is not dependent on the health care that we get in the hospital, but on the other things that matter in our lives. Not to discount the work that we get or the, what happens in a hospital. I mean, if my relative were about to go through surgery or had an emergency or wanted a good primary care doctor, I would want to make sure they have the best care possible. But these other factors matter a lot too. And we see this playing out in our communities all the time. In Baltimore, all of you I'm sure have heard about Freddie Gray. It was not, you know, it was in the news in Baltimore. I'm not sure how much it was in other places, but Freddie Gray himself was lead poisoned as a child. We have Flint that's happening, and we wonder how many other Flints exist in our country and how many of our children are denied opportunities for health and for education before they could even start. You know, I see my patients who have heart disease, who have diabetes, and I, and I ask them to, have, to eat healthier foods. But if they tell me that the only way that they can reach a grocery store is by taking two buses or walking three and a half miles, I'm not sure that I'm being, that, or if, am I just being disingenuous to ask them to eat healthier if they can't do it? We have many schools in Baltimore where kids don't have recess. Kids don't have recess. And the neighborhoods that they live in, if I say to their parents, please make sure that your child has exercise, they'll say, how? We don't have a park nearby. We don't feel safe walking outside. Our kids don't have recess, so how are we going to do that? So I'm sure all of you have examples right here in Seattle about these social determinants of health. And I almost feel like sometimes these social determinants become a catchphrase. And we don't really know what that means. But to me, this is what social determinants means. It's been said that the currency of inequality is years of life. Currency of inequality is years of life. And for me, that then translates to what are those other determinants that get us there? And how can we prevent the inevitable if the currency of inequality is years of life, then the opposite of poverty becomes health. So to me, the social determinants are what are those things that we can help to shape so that we don't, that does not become an inevitability. And where our children live should not determine if they live. And so sometimes, you know, one of the challenges of talking about the, the social determinants that I found is when we say that health is about everything, Sometimes people tune out and they say, well, there's nothing I can do to start. Because if health is about everything, I can't change education, I can't change the criminal justice system, you know, I can't change all these other things. So then we feel like we're powerless to start and certainly that's how I felt with my patient in the ED when I thought, I can't get this person to treatment, I can't change the circumstances of their life, where, where, where do I start? But I'll challenge all of us to think this way, that if we have a patient in crisis in our clinical work. If that patient is very complicated, 
Maybe it's a patient with heart disease and diabetes and is, has cancer, is now in a car accident, is now unresponsive. We don't know what's going on with that person. Our response is never to say, it's just too complicated. I'm not gonna do anything. We would never find that acceptable as clinicians. And so I would challenge that as we begin thinking about how to tackle these social determinants, that we also begin considering what is it that I can do now with the tools that I have? So I want to give you three specific examples of this, and, or just three things to think about. I, I should have prefaced on my, my speech, actually, to say that I really don't have answers. Maybe that's what Dr. Larson thought that I, I, I would have not come here. I don't have any answers. Surprise. Um, <laughs> <laughs> I'm looking for all of you to help come up with the answers, with the solutions, and today I just want to give you some ideas from Baltimore. I mean, everything that we do is a work in progress. We are, we've started a lot, of, a lot of projects, we have a lot of things that we believe are going in the right direction, but we don't know. And research and metrics and evaluation will be important to us getting there, but also having your input will, will, will be important too. So I want to give you just three examples of things that we have done, and I would love to hear your, your thoughts about that later. So I want to start with one problem. First problem is infant mortality. You know, we in Baltimore, just as I imagine all of you, we believe in starting as early as possible and giving our kids every opportunity. Yet, in 2009, I'll give you a couple of, of statistics here, seeing all the researchers who are, who are in the room. In 2009, Baltimore had one of the worst infant mortality rates in the country. If you compared infant mortality in Baltimore at the time, we were on par with countries in the middle of civil war. And when you looked at disparities, it was so horrific. So this statistic I, I find so jarring, I almost can't say it, but the, the um, likelihood of African-American babies to die as infants was five times as it was for white babies. If at the time you asked leaders in our city what the issue was, everybody would have said lack of resources, which is a true statement. I mean, I don't, you know, if for any of you who are donors out there, we're not, we're, we're still short of resources now. We would never say that we have too many resources. But there was another issue too which was that as we looked around the city and identified issues, we saw that there were over 100 different groups that were working on maternal and child health and improving outcomes in some way. And these were groups that were doing great work. There were sororities, fraternities, there were church groups, there were neighborhood associations that were going door to door. There were um, hospitals and clinics. And, I mean, there were great things that were happening. And individuals may have been helped, but what if 80% of the services were delivered to 10% of the population? How, what, what was the coordinated strategy to make sure that we were actually moving the needle as a city? So as a result of recognizing this, the health department formed a coalition of over 150 partners, which was very challenging because everybody wants to do their own thing. They have their own program set up that they're very proud of. And so it took years for this coalition to be formed. But the health department in the city basically set a strategy in North Star, which I believe that we must have, because we have to break down these silos in order to get everybody on the same page. And so we had a North Star, and the goal actually is as simple as, as, as it gets, as objective as it gets, because infant mortality pretty basic and pretty important to measure. We set that as the goal, got all the partners on board, including with a strategy for universal triage. Every pregnant woman on Medicaid gets triaged to a central system. And then it's determined what level of services they should get, from nurse home visiting to social workers to community health workers. They all got some type of services. We did the ABCs of safe sleep everywhere in our communities, delivered cribs, did breastfeeding classes, hired many individuals who are from the communities that they come from in order to do peer education. As a result, within six years, infant mortality dropped across the city by 28%. Number of babies dying in their sleep reduced by half. 
and the disparity between black and white infant, uh, in, um, in, in infant mortality closed by 40%. We also did reproductive health education, by, by, by the way, and provide services. We were talking about this last night. I had the opportunity to present to, you a, to, to the National Physicians Alliance and thank Dr. Meyer for that invitation, but um, had the opportunity to also talk about the importance of reproductive health. And we provide reproductive health services actually in many of our schools, among other places. And so as a result, the teen birth rates in that same period dropped by 36%. So I give this example, not because we've solved the problem, certainly we have a long way to go before we even match the data for the rest of Maryland and other similar urban cities. But I also think it's important for us to talk about our successes, for us to talk about what's worked, and to be able to learn from it. And in this case, this is something BMO for Healthy Babies is one of our signature programs because it illustrates why it is so important for us to break down these silos, to have that shared goal, and to work towards that common outcome. Second story. And this is less of a story as it is of a question that's been posed to me multiple times that I have a specific answer to, but I'm not sure what all of your answers will be. I have heard time and time again, what is the role of local public health in the setting of the ACA? And I know that we have people here today from Seattle King County, and so I'd be curious to talk to them later about the role of the health department in here in, um, in, in Seattle. But specifically in Baltimore, I have been questioned about what, it, what should that role be? Because, for example, I still provide, I provide health services in every one of our 189 public schools. And people have said, and we have two clinics in the city that serve 30,000 people. And so people have said, why do you need to do that? Because shouldn't every child have a pediatrician? Shouldn't every patient have a primary care medical home? Why do you still provide these services? Is that increasing the fragmentation? Why are you still doing that? Well, this is what I say. So I don't know the demographics of, of Seattle very well, but for those of you, I know a lot of you know the DC, Baltimore area. If you live in Bethesda, where the NIH is in, in DC, the median income in Bethesda, Maryland is 180,000. If that's the case, then probably every one of most of the kids, if not all the kids have a pediatrician, they're going regularly to get their immunizations, they're going regularly to get all their uh, screenings and exams, and that's great. And I think that that is the right model that we should pursue. But in our city, I have 85,000 children. One third of these children live below the poverty line. On any given day, there are thousands of our kids who are homeless, who are unstably housed, or actually are living on the streets. In that kind of situation, it's either my choice on the first day of school to send thousands of kids home because they don't have their immunizations, or it's to figure out to provide immunizations to our kids where they are. We actually have, by the way, because of this, because of doing immunizations in all of our schools, we have one of the highest immunization rates in the country. Then our choice is either to send the kid to the ER every time when he or she has an asthma attack, or we can say, let's have a nurse in the school or a nurse practitioner. We have a nurse practitioner or a physician or a physician in 15 of our schools in the city. We can say we'll do the full range of diagnosis and treatment and monitoring instead and not have the kid miss school instead. There is a, um, we, I found out when I first started about a problem that seems just about as straightforward as any, which is that our kids, approximately 10,000 of our kids in the city need glasses and don't have them. And this was the problem, that Maryland law requires for glasses screening, or revision screening to occur in pre-K, first grade, and eighth grade. So I wear contacts, and a lot of you I see wear glasses. How many of you had vision issues that were diagnosed between first grade and eighth grade? So a lot of you in the room, so you know that it might present a bit of a problem if a child waits between first and eighth grade to be diagnosed. Another issue though, even among the kids who were getting screened, less than 20% of them were actually getting glasses. 
for a variety of reasons. Maybe there were issues with transportation. Maybe, there, maybe the information about the positive screening never reached the parents and the caregivers. Whatever the reason was, we knew that there were about 10,000 kids who needed glasses who are not getting them. And so we said, this is untenable. I mean, we, again, don't need a study. Those studies are good. <laughs> and we, are, we do have an evaluation partner for, for this after. But we didn't need a study to tell us that this was something important to do, because if a kid can't see, they can't read, they can't learn, and may be labeled as being disruptive, and then put back further in class, when actually what they needed was a pair of glasses. And so we said, we need to figure this out. And Medicaid, first of all, came. Um, we talked to Medicaid, and, and our insurers were saying, well, we don't see the problem, because it does, our insurance does cover for kids to go to an optician, an optometrist, and get glasses, which is great, except that that was not currently what was happening in our schools. Again, if we lived in Bethesda, maybe that would be happening, but that was not happening in our community. And so we said, we're going to figure this out. What we did was we launched a program now called Vision for Baltimore, where every child will get their eye screenings done every year in their schools. And immediately, we have a mobile system where the full eye exam and the glasses will be delivered in the schools as well. And that way, our kids don't have to miss school, our parents and caregivers don't have to miss work, and I think importantly too, we are eliminating all those other barriers where somebody could have fallen through the cracks. Now, I don't think that this is the only thing that we can do in order to improve literacy rates in order to improve education, in order to, to, uh, to reduce youth violence. Of course, there are many other factors involved. But I also strongly believe that there is a role for local public health. There is a role for all of us saying, what is it that I can do right now with the opportunities that I have right now? And similarly, th this idea of going to where people are is also what we've done with our overdose work. You know, it used to be that our, we would be able to give naloxone only to patients who had an opioid use disorder, which is a good idea to do, but if you're overdosing yourself, pretty hard to give yourself a life-saving medication. And so we got the law passed so that we began training family and friends and police officers, and actually in the first eight months of having our police carry this medication, they saved over 30 lives. We have uh, our needle exchange van. We've had needle exchange in the city for over 20 years. Our needle exchange van goes to 24 different locations around the city. And we actually plot on the map to see where it is that overdoses are occurring, where it is that drug arrests are happening, and we specifically target outreach and trainings in those particular areas. That's the work that we do of going to where people are. That I do believe that there is a role, even at a time of ACA, of health care access that there is a role for health services. Finally, I want to tell you about another program also in this second category of what do we do in the time of the ACA. I actually see public health as having an expanded presence. And here's why. Because we're able to do things that may not traditionally be considered health, and certainly not considered health care. My, um, my department, we run a program called Safe Streets. Have any of you heard of Cure Violence? Cure Violence is based in Chicago, so several of you have. Um, Cure, uh, Cure Violence and our Safe Streets program um, involves hiring individuals, many of whom are recently released from incarceration, who are former gang members, former drug dealers, to walk the streets of our city and mediate violence.